So for me, this is probably one of the most fun parts of the day, and we will ask you all to bring your questions, and we'll have some Q&A at the end, but I'm really happy to introduce Stormy Peters, who is um, the head of our Open Standards and Software group at, uh, at Red, Red Hat, leading a lot of the community events and um, projects. And we're going to bring in um, our panelists, and I'll let Stormy introduce them as they come on. I'm going to let them walk up and get seated, and then we're going to get started and they'll introduce themselves. While they're getting seated, um, this is the upstream panel, upstream this. How many people here know what upstream means? Awesome. Here, let's hear some answers. Shout them out. Shout out the answers. What does upstream mean? Where all the fun happens. Where all the fun happens. Any other answers for upstream? Community. Community. One more. Collaboration. collaboration. So the upstream is where the open source software collaboration community and fun happens. Um, so this is a panel. We're not going to be able to give you all the information about upstream in half an hour. This is a panel to introduce you to some of our upstream contributors. There are also others of you sitting in the audience. Um, and this is to start conversations that you can have over lunch, you can have later today, um, you can have at the, the get together, you can have during this week at KubeCon. So this is a conversation starter. Um, so with that, I was going to ask our panelists to introduce themselves, say their name, what project they work on, and then to, you, you know how like when you're trying to describe what you work on to somebody who has no clue, maybe it's your neighbor who's a surgeon, uh, maybe it's your, your kid's teacher, and you try to use analogies and you try to use metaphors and you end up in this big complicated mess. I'm going to ask each of our panelists to share their favorite analogy that they use um, when they're trying to describe some technology that they work on. And Clayton's going to tell us what an analogy is just to get us started. An analogy is when you compare something to something else for the purposes of explanation. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, Chris, would you like to get us started? Your name, uh, what project you work on, and then some analogy that you try to use to describe what you do. OK. Uh, whoa. Oh, sorry. Um, hi, everyone. I am Chris Nova. I work. At, thank you, everybody who waved back. That means a lot to me. Uh, I work at Heptio, um, which is freaking great. Uh, and then I guess my analogy, like this is going to be really like everybody here probably already knows what I'm going to pick, but I'm going to compare it to mountains because that's I do a lot of mountaineering. Um, and I think like there's just a lot to be said about like going one step at a time to take over like a really monolithic task. A lot of the stuff we do in Kubernetes and open source is like, I'll walk up to it and be like, whoa, like where do I even start working on this thing? And I think it's like sometimes just really important to just kind of like take a deep breath and just take your first step. So that was really good analogy. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, I'm Clayton Coleman, uh, architect at Open uh, on OpenShift and Kubernetes at Red Hat. I also work in the Kubernetes community a lot. Um, so my analogy is, is I usually start with, um, you don't know what I do. But when it stops working, you will all regret it. And that's a nice icebreaker. And then I usually spend a bunch of time, which is like all of the things that we all build are incredibly complicated and nobody understands it anymore. And so by analogy, we're sitting on a giant mountain of stuff that's built. And there's like some guy at the bottom who's like hitting the foundation piece and it's going to fall out one day. And I'm the guy trying to keep the guy from knocking the foundation piece out. I'm Paul. I work at Red Hat, uh, focusing on the service catalog and service broker space and multi-cluster. The analogy that I use is uh, not impressive because I, I'm typically explaining the service catalog, which is basically what it sounds like. If, <laughs> if you imagine, think of you 100 years ago and you want to build a house. So, of course, you look at the Sears catalog, uh, which is approximately two feet high, and uh, you, can, you can order the thing out of the catalog and it comes to you. That's actually a terrible analogy also because the houses that you ordered from Sears catalog, which is actually a thing, did not come assembled. And uh, part of uh, service catalog and the concept of a broker is that you don't, you don't care at all. So very bad analogy. <laughs> But it did, uh, you didn't ask for a good one. So <laughs> I, I completed my task. Uh, I'm, I'm Brendan Burns. Uh, I work at Microsoft Azure uh, on containers and DevOps. 
Uh, my analogy is that when I was eight, I, I think it was about eight, I spent about six months building a remote control plane um, and it took a long time. And I went out to fly it and it went, then it went right into the ground. So six months of my life gone in about 10 seconds. Um, and now my kids use an iPad to fly a quadcopter around our house. Um, and so we're building software that helps people who build uh, systems have an experience that's more like my kids have and less like what I have. So. And never get on a plane that Brendan built. Yeah, that, it was because it was like balsa wood and paper. I mean, if you get on a plane and it's balsa wood, like just turn around. Yeah. Good thing for Brendan, no one that has ridden on a plane that he's built is here today. That's true, it's exactly right. That's right. I have no complaints. I've never had a complaint, never had a single complaint. Okay, I'm Purna Sinha, um, and I'm a product manager on the Kubernetes project. Um, my analogy is uh, that of a, I guess, a rocket ship. Um, I feel like we, not the interesting aspect of flying a rocket ship, but um, of putting it together. Uh, so I think of uh, the work that I do as being in a environment where there's lots of moving pieces and we're trying to build this thing that's gonna, that's gonna take off. And it's very important not to have any unscheduled disassemblies on a rocket. That's one of the most important things. <laughs> when it's flying. All right, so now I'm gonna like, give you guys a minute to tell your neighbor what your analogy would be. See, so I'll have one minute to tell your neighbor what your analogy would be. And if there's no one sitting right next to you, turn around and talk to the person right behind you. dollars just smashed on the surface of Mars because they didn't do their units correctly. Distributed systems for Mars. Actually, we haven't had a, I don't think we've had a... There's another one, there's another one where they tested. All right, I'm going to call everybody out. Now that you know, now that you all know the best and the worst ways to describe the technologies that we work on. Um, and my panel is just talking all about rockets. So I think we're going to like now talk about rockets instead of open shift. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Sorry about that. I'm liking this rocket idea. I, maybe we could shift. All right. So if you have any questions to start this out, at any point you can jump in. Wave your arms if I don't see you. We don't have mics, so you're going to have to shout, and I will do my best to listen. Um, any questions about rockets, analogies, Kubernetes, OpenShift? Anyone we'll take similes also, not just analogies. Please. Is it a NASA rocket or a Tesla rocket? Honestly, it's the bunch of rednecks in their backyard with beers. It's, it's the dude with the steam-powered rocket, actually. Right. It is most definitely an open-source rocket. These guys Next are question. both wrong. It's the, uh, it's the probe from Star Trek IV. <laughs> I, I think it's, it's, it's still under construction, so. It's going to be the NASA rocket, but. I mean, it's starting to kind of look like a rocket, so that's good. At least we got that going for us. All right, is there another question? Start us out. All right, so, so this, is, this technology is a pretty, Kubernetes and the surrounding technologies are, are all open source software. They have a lot of the aspects of traditional open source software, and it's also a pretty unique place that really fosters innovation on top of it. Um, would anybody, would, what, what do you think is unique about it that fosters that innovation? Um, so for me, the Kubernetes community and the way that we sort of all come together to engineer the process of engineering is super unique coming from other communities in like the open source and Linuxy Apache space to Kubernetes was a really big jump for me. And I think as a software engineer, like I really, really thrive in this environment where I get to speak my mind and collaborate with other people and look at our software in the same way we actually look at our process as, you know, through the lens of an engineer. And that's really, really powerful for me. 
I was going to say one of the things that I really enjoy is um, using, and I think it's somewhat unique, is using what you build. So a lot of open source projects, you don't necessarily use what we build. Like Linux is a great example. Like most of the people who hack on Linux actually use Linux. And in Kubernetes, like a lot of the things that are components of the system run on top of Kubernetes. And so we're getting better. I'm not there yet, but we're getting better at, hey, all of these problems that we're having are problems that most of our users have. And it does help focus the mind a lot in Kubernetes. I really enjoy that. I think it's sort of unique also because it was built from the ground up to help and empower users, right? It wasn't, I think a lot of projects kind of come out of like, oh, I really want to build that or I really want to, you know, I have this itch to scratch or something like that. I think Kubernetes really came out of a desire to help people build software better. I think that's relatively unique in the open source space and I think that's part of why it's developed such a great ecosystem. I think also we've been blessed with really fantastic people throughout the, the community and it really helped get the DNA right. Speaking of the rocket ship at some level, like little tiny bits of angle in the early trajectory make really big differences and I think that we got really lucky in the first three to six months where we just got the trajectory really right. Yeah, we've got some rocket scientists. <laughs> um, I think what's unique is that you can join. Um, it's kind of rare to be able to join in building something like this, but this is a community which thrives on contributors, um, and a lot of users join. Um, so to Clayton's point, um, it's also, that's also actually quite unique, so. Yeah. I would also say like, I mean, having been around open source a lot, I'm not a huge fan of BDFL projects, um, and so we sort of explicitly set it up from the beginning to not be that, and I think that's helped Make it can, open. Can you expand on that to not be a what? Uh, BDFL, benevolent, benevolent dictator for life. Okay. Um, I don't know if everybody knows that. I think everybody knows that, right? Yeah. Not uh, so inclusive. Yeah, like, well, and just, yeah, I think, they're, they're, so we sort of set it up in the beginning to be inclusive and humble, and, and I think that's really paid a lot of dividends. And so what happens is you get um, this uh, conglomeration of really smart um, and really friendly and um, really interesting people. Uh, and you can learn a lot from everyone that you meet. Uh, I, th I think that, uh, honestly, there's never been a, a community like that, at least that I've experienced before. And, and so each of you are working in different areas of technology. We've got cluster APIs, we've got service brokers. What is happening in your space? Um, what are you doing to foster innovation? And how would somebody who wanted to get more involved, how would they follow along or how would they join? Um, so I spend a lot of time working like on the infrastructure side of things in Kubernetes. Uh, so I'm a member of SIG Cluster Lifecycle and we have a working group for the cluster API that we're working on now. Uh, Robert Bailey and I are giving a talk on it on Thursday if you guys want to come check it out. But like getting involved, it's, it's really like join the SIG calls, uh, like comment on things on GitHub. This is a huge one. Like uh, the first time I started commenting on Kubernetes stuff, I was kind of like, Am I allowed to do this? Does it, you know, is this okay? And like now I'm a maintainer of a couple of repos in the Kubernetes org. So what kind of comment did you leave? I just like my two cents, right? Like I agree with this or I don't agree with this or like I don't think that we needed to put an interface here or you know, just kind of like whatever. And even if it's not like a super technical comment, I still think user experience is something that we really need to focus on in Kubernetes. So even if you're like sitting at a command line and just something feels weird or backwards, like bringing that up and making that known is super important. There's ways to get involved in non-technical functions. Um, uh, one thing to do is, I think, just use the product and kind of understand what it is. And then all of the SIGs um, and all of the meetings are open and everybody is invited. So you can join the community meeting, which is on Thursdays at 10 a.m. Pacific, or you can join any of the SIG meetings, which are all published on GitHub, um, and just kind of start to listen in and then see if there's a role that you'd like to play. One of the nice things about the Kubernetes community is that uh, I feel that very strongly that uh, folks who make contributions in the form of like taking notes or uh, organizing meetings, like things that are non-technical, are command just as much as res just a much just as much respect as people that are primarily contributing code, and that's uh, really awesome on a couple different levels because that's typically something that's that's overlooked. Um, but I would urge anybody in this room that wants to get involved, uh, start attending community meetings, start attending SIG meetings, and uh, the, the, the reality of the non-technical non contribution type track is that uh, those things tend to be things that engineers are like terrible at. So they're incredibly valuable, 
even just taking notes is, is a, a really valuable skill. Um, for my own little slice of the world, uh, one thing that we recently discussed in a uh, open service broker API face-to-face -face in Raleigh last week actually, uh, is adding new generic action support to that API so that you can prototype things without having to go through the process of changing the official API, which we hope will be a way for people to incubate and experiment things and maybe have some emergent conventions in the actual spec itself. Yeah, along those lines, I would say at this point, amazing three years later, but um, Kubernetes is a commodity at this point. Um, you can get it easily off of any cloud. Um, and so I, I think a lot of what's exciting is building on top of those APIs, um, figuring out there's just so many interesting, cool tools that people have built out in the ecosystem effectively by themselves uh, or with a small group of people. Like, you don't even have to be involved in the main community to make a contribution. You can build a tool that helps manage configs or manage certificates or something that is useful, generically useful, on top of these APIs that are now available to people across the world. Um, that's also a really great way to kind of get your feet wet. There are also meetups worldwide. And so as you start using Kubernetes, um, even if you're not contributing to it, you can go and share your experience. And um, you can often give talks, and it's very valuable. Yeah, I was going to, Brendan totally stole mine because I think the idea here is that like Cube has gotten so big in the last three years, like there's a lot of stuff that it does. It just can't keep growing forever. So we need to get really, really good at making sure, and Brendan's led a lot of this stuff on the client side and um, going and using the client generators to make clients for new languages. And, you know, I think we need to do more. And like, this is something that I try to spend a lot of time on is taking feedback from people who are building stuff and then saying, like, what do you need to be successful? Like, watching what they do and trying to tweak what we do to make that more powerful. Any questions from our audience? Yep. We had uh, mention of code that writes itself. Can someone explain that? We had a mention of code that writes itself. Can somebody explain that? Are if you you're hiding this machine in your basement, I would like it. <laughs> are, are we talking about generating code from, like, a, like the open ice spec? No, so there was a talk by TELUS earlier um, oh, where it. they talked about, as a, as a vision, I think, um, that they're not going to stop until the code writes itself. And, Can't stop. Won't and I think stop. that's a good, that's a visionary statement. And I think that that's a, that's a good vision. Um, and others should certainly comment. Where I, where, what I took that to mean is, you know, um, a lot of um, analytics um, and, and uh, machine learning can generate output that is useful. Um, uh, to to the application, so but so potentially, I don't know if the code would write itself, but there could be um, connections of existing modules that you know uh, create an application that's new or, or uh, result in something that's new. And I think they were also talking about functions as a service and maybe maybe tying that together. But I do believe it was a visionary statement. I, I'd also refer you to a talk by Steph Walters that he gave at a conference in Berlin, and he says he has a cyborg team member, and he talks about the things they give the. The computer to do their cyborg team member that they would typically have done before. I think another thing that I've been playing around with a lot actually, and, and I'll talk about actually in my keynote tomorrow, um, is this notion of how we build abstraction layers on top of Kubernetes, right? I think that it is still way too hard to build distributed systems, and in Kubernetes we have maybe created an assembly language, but we have not created uh, higher level programming languages, and I think that is an interesting next step. It's not really code that writes itself, but it's at least a higher level language that you can compile down into these building blocks to enable people to not have to necessarily think about them. Yeah. I think the concepts comes up, obviously, because there are so many things in Kubernetes that, um, you know, over time will, will manage themselves. So clusters that repair themselves and scale themselves. And uh, so that leads to, okay, if the infrastructure takes care of itself, can we do something like that also at the application level? Right. Any other questions? Yep. Especially if you work in a platform. Can you, start, can you start over? Sorry. So one fundamental dilemma that you guys on Upstreams have is creating uh, something that collaborate across different companies. But the people on top who actually create the product is create something different uh, because they want to flavor, uh, create something different on market. So each company has different to flavor. How you guys can guarantee the freedom the user can jump from one product to another, um, uh, I don't know, is, is, is that a concern that guy has an upstream? So the, the question is, if you get Kubernetes from, from one vendor, how, do you make, how are we making sure as a community you could move to another vendor? 
I, I think the, uh, the Kubernetes API here is super important. And if you look at like the, the programming language Go that a lot of it's written in, you see these implicit interfaces. And I think the sort of idea of defining the pattern or the API, like Brendan was saying, first, and then having opinionated uh, implementations of that API, and that can be either from an open source project or a company or a product or whatever. Um, I, th I think that pattern in general is something that really shines in Kubernetes, and being able to lift and shift from one to the other is really taking advantage of that API abstraction. I think another, another thing is that for a lot of us, I don't have to differentiate in terms of product. I differentiate in terms of service, right? I differentiate in terms of Kubernetes as a service as opposed to in terms of on top. So I think it's kind of like you don't really differentiate on the x86 instruction set. Um, I, I think there's a degree to which it's just a baseline that, that cloud providers provide for you, and, and then the product is the reliability, the price point, all of that sort of thing. Yeah, and I would actually add too, like to, to that, the idea of APIs, like the Kubernetes API will not be the last API ever created in the history of mankind. What'll actually happen is just like every other API, like an assembly is a good metaphor because there's x86, but then there's microcode, and then there's the transistors, and then there's the actual modules, and then there's the bio. Like, I think we're actually gonna see a lot of that, and we're seeing it today. Like everybody has build systems in their company today. And sometimes they wanna change them, sometimes they actually wanna hook things in. And so we're starting to see like, we, it should be really easy, and like to Brennan's point, to stack layers really cleanly not everybody's going to choose the same layers. If you can switch layers out, bring pieces together, that's like a, the writing code is, what are the pieces, the tools that help people build distributed systems, help people tie together build chains, roll things out to production? Because at the end of the day, that's all that actually matters, right? Is how do you deliver software? So some of the, I think some of like the opinionated ones, like OpenShift is somewhat opinionated, tries to tie all these together and it hits certain optimized points, but not everybody is going to build software that way. And so I think it's layering up multiple layers of very well-designed independent pieces that can be composed is how, like, it is the only way that this will evolve. Like, you can't just design the perfect system and everybody will use it. I think we'd be remiss to not mention the conformance program, um, which I talked about earlier uh, and which launched, uh, I think, uh, just before Thanksgiving, um, which is a set of tests that uh, any Kubernetes distribution can run and then publish results back on GitHub um, that shows that it is conformant. Um, and it's, it's not a complete set of tests right now, but over the course of this year, we're gonna be expanding that set of tests. Um, and the, the goal is to ensure that the Kubernetes API is fully exposed um, and that uh, ap applications that are running on Kubernetes can uh, be portable ac across um, distributions. So, yeah. So um, referring to analogies and all that, uh, so we've gone in the computer building the normal computer. There's analogies to that, what, what's happening again today in the distributed systems, right? Yeah, has anyone mapped that journey, sort of, you know, like you mentioned, assembly, and obviously things have evolved. We've been doing computers for a lot further than distributed systems. So, and the networking has the OSI layer. So we were all talking about these things. Has anyone kind of tried to create an infographic, or something that helps us map that journey a little bit better? I don't know about any infographics. I think about it a lot. I think that there's a challenge here because, um, you know, there's this really obvious analogy where you say, oh, the distributed system is just a computer, and then you realize that it's actually not. Um, and it's kind of like a really bad NUMA computer. Um, and but computers are also really bad NUMA computers. No, and that's true. And so, like, and then, and, and then you forget, and then, because, like, people cared, and then people stopped caring, and maybe people will stop caring again. And I think at a certain level, people don't care. I do think that I, I kind of feel like with Kubernetes, um, we've kind of created processes. And I've, and I've often said that I kind of felt like the Kubernetes API or like some API layer would be sort of the POSIX of distributed systems. Um, I think we're headed in that direction. Um, I think that there's a long way to go and it's not entirely clear how much of it, the analogy is an inspiration versus a literal analogy. Um, but it's definitely an area that, that I'm interested in exploring. One of my favorite quotes is, uh, the future's here, it's just not evenly distributed, right? Yes. So the big companies have been doing this for years, and so they've got lots of these patterns baked in. And if you look at Kubernetes, like a lot of it is folks like Brendan and Tim and Brian saying, like, we have all these patterns, let's boil them down to their essences and put them out there. And every day someone comes to Kubernetes and does the same thing for networking or for storage, or they take the new ideas. So I would actually say the really thing that we should really try to do in Kubernetes is the meta, right? It's the, my, the process of thinking about how you build things so that they fit well together and they solve problems really quickly in the distributed system space. Like, I, 
I won't cast any aspersions, but like just as a random example, the EC2 API was not designed as something that was going to magically make all of building applications easier. It was designed to deliver VMs. I think we're trying to be a little bit more deliberate on what are the things that applications need and design APIs for that and think a little bit about what's above and what's below and then try to put them together. I think the APIs will change, but the process is what's important. Like, can you plug stuff in and get value out of it incrementally? Yeah, I think there's a real challenge. I mean, the one challenge I would say is every time, every one of these systems that I've seen, it kind of stops where Kubernetes has stopped, right? Which is like a bunch of sort of relatively raw application-oriented infrastructure primitives. And then it either jumps all the way to PaaS or it just kind of huddles along at, at this level. And I think what we need to do next is to figure out how do you build the standard library and the compiler that lives above Kubernetes in a modular way that doesn't turn into PaaS. And that, I think, is the real challenge that I, that, that I want to spend a lot of time, that I spend a lot of time thinking about and that I want to spend a lot of time thinking about, because I think that's where we actually get to what you're talking about. If, if we just build verticalized PaaSs, we only, the only place we unify is at this low-level assembly language. If we start thinking about how do you build higher-level languages that are utilities, not platforms, then we may have a chance, yeah. but it's so really, really hard is my experience. So I'm gonna cut this one off because it sounds like an awesome conversation. Sounds like it should be over a beer this afternoon or it could be a whole session on itself. Lots of beer. Yes, or it could be a book too, yeah, cool. So you all know who's interested in having the conversation, find them at lunch, find them over a beer. Any other questions? All right, so I asked a lot of questions about how things work. Uh, now let's switch a little bit to technology, and each of you work on different aspects. If you could tell me one really cool thing that you're working on right now um, that you think will foster innovation in your space or innovation for those that are developing on top of it, um, give us a, a, you know, a one-minute update of what's happening in your project. Chris, you want to lead us off? Sure. Um, so like I mentioned earlier, I'm doing a lot of work uh, with folks over at Google um, and in the SIG Cluster Lifecycle group for the cluster API. And I think the sort of 10,000 foot view here is we want to have a declarative way of defining infrastructure. Um, and the really exciting part of that is having a set of what we call uh, machines, which represent a virtual machine in the cloud, and having a controller that sort of takes this Kubernetes declarative first principle and applies that to infrastructure is something that's really exciting to me. And I think a lot of folks are going to get some value out of it when you start looking at things like business logic and maybe we want to auto scale based on arbitrary rules that are encapsulated in software. Um, so I just think there's a lot of modularity and flexibility. And this is something I've been kind of working on for like about a year now. And to see it kind of come to life is really, really exciting for me. Are you talking about that this week? Yeah, so we're going to be demoing uh, the machine API that I just talked about, um, and we'll be talking about like the journey of how we got here and why we named things what we did and you know what everything represents inside of the API we're proposing. Cool. Um, one of the things that I've been working on is the container identity working group. And this is kind of the idea that you know you have all these like services all over the place and all these pods all over the place and. You kind of want to be able to say, like, well, who is it that's talking to me? Because if you want to build an integration, you want to say, okay, well, I know that I should only give this secret out to this particular workload running on this particular um, node. And so we've been working um, with a bunch of folks in the community, the Spiffy effort um, and Spire, which is a group of people working on kind of a generic spec that works across cloud and metal. We've also been looking at how we can break up Kubernetes and make this easier and trying to say like, every time we break something out of cubes, so you can say like, I want to plug Kerberos in or I want to plug PKI in, um, doing it in a way that really makes it easier for everybody else to benefit, even if this is very specific to any, making it easier to do extension at the node level. So that's been really exciting and I've enjoyed it. And if someone wanted to talk to you about it, do you have a talk or? Um, there is a container identity, um, uh, meet up on the calendar. I actually don't even know what day it is. Like I'm very just in time scheduling, um, but we will, it will be uh, a topic and um, please come find me or uh, Greg Castle from Google and we'd be happy to talk about it. One of the things uh, my team has been looking at recently, which is very interesting to me is uh, there's a lot of different reasons that uh, users want to run multiple clusters of Kubernetes or OpenShift. And when you introduce the idea that like, you now have n different clusters to care for, the logical implication is that you have to have a record of what all those different clusters are and how do you reach them. Uh, so uh, the SIG multi-cluster in the Kubernetes community has been uh, 
bootstrapping an effort on a cluster registry, which is an API server that just has a cluster resource, which is where is this thing and how do I talk to it? And it's really exciting to me because uh, I think this will accelerate and uh, unify to some degree different efforts in the community around building tooling to handle multiple clusters at the same time, which seems like an inevitable challenge to get over. Uh, so there is a SIG multi-cluster deep dive that I believe this will be mentioned in. Like Clayton, uh, I do not know the day of the week that it will be, but it is a thing at KubeCon, which is where we are going to be. Tomorrow. Yes. So tomorrow's cloud native. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> it's not Wednesday. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I'm really excited about a bunch of the work that, that my, the Azure team has been doing in open source developer productivity. Um, so from things like the Kubernetes and Visual Studio Code uh, to this tool called Draft, which is sort of a rapid iteration, local rapid iteration experience between your cluster and your workspace on your desktop, uh, to Brigade, which is a workflow system built on top of Kubernetes that people open sourced a couple weeks ago, um, to the work that I was, was talking about the, called MetaParticle that I'm giving my keynote about tomorrow. I'm just really excited in general about the space that lives above the Kubernetes API that enables people to build applications more easily or even at all uh, when they couldn't have before. So I'm a product manager, so I tend to bring things together in the project in the service of what users are likely to use. My talk is on Friday, and I will be uh, giving a demo of a hybrid deployment with two clusters, one that's an on-premise cluster and one that's a GKE cluster. I'll be using um, the multi-cluster registry and demo demonstrating that. Um, I will also be using the open service broker um, and the uh, service catalog to show um, uh, an application that runs in a hybrid manner. So please come to that. That's at 11 on Friday. All the hits in that one. <laughs> <laughs> So Hopefully I have one more question for our panelists, um, but before I get to that, oh, go ahead. I think he's asking Paul about federation. Yeah, so the question was uh, whether I was d describing federation, which is a project that has been in uh, the Kubernetes code base for a while. It was actually recently moved out into Kubernetes federation. And uh, Justin, to answer your question, the, uh, the answer is, uh, the, the Federation has a cluster resource that we're talking about replacing now with the cluster resource that comes from the cluster registry. Good question. And I think in general the difference would be that Federation thought a lot about maybe what API objects you might want to define at a worldwide level that would then create things in the cluster, whereas I think this is merely about like, I just have a bunch and I want to organize them and I need to get at them in a bunch of different ways. And yep. I think it's a much simpler use case. I think the Federation use case was always experimental um, and, and has proven out over the course of the last couple of years to be, to be experimental. And, and so I think this yeah. is a very practical solution. Ar architecturally, the uh, multi-cluster um, uh, thinking is um, to have uh, state from multiple clusters in a single registry and to be able to operate on them in an iterative way from uh, from the registry and to have that be a highly available control plane versus federation was very much like a tree where you had sort of a single point um, from which you could control all of the APIs and that, that single point was to look like any other cluster. Um, these are two different architectural approaches, both meant to manage multiple clusters. The cluster is not a proxy also. The cluster resource is not a proxy, whereas federation was. Okay, so I, we don't have time for more questions, but it's awesome that you have questions you, I have one more question that I'm going to use to close with, um, and you can find them all at lunch or this afternoon. But before I do that, I think any session you go to, any conference you go to, at the end of every session, you should think about, like, what did I get out of that? Like, why did I sit there for half an hour? And it may be something you heard that was new. It may be something that sparked a thought of your own that you want to follow up on so that you don't lose that in this, you know, you're going to be in a lot of sessions this week, and you've already been in a lot of sessions this morning. I'd like you to share with your neighbor What's the one thing you heard that you learned or the one thing that sparked another thought in you or the one conversation that you want to have after this? So tell your neighbor the one thing that this half hour was worth to you. Rockets. rockets. <laughs> we got rockets up here. Definitely rockets from up here. Brendan, what was the other, graph? What was it called? The tool you mentioned? Draft. 
draft. Oh, draft. Okay. I was yeah. like, I've never. I don't pronounce very well. But Got it. Enunciation has never been my. Uh, yeah. I was like, this sounds a lot like draft. What is it? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> All right, so I gave you just enough time to be a teaser. Sorry about that. So I encourage you to have these conversations later. If you had ideas or thoughts that it sparked or something you want to share, please tweet, please blog. And I'm going to have our panelists close. They're going to tell you their name. I need everybody's attention so that they can. Thanks. So awesome ideas. Glad there's conversation happening. Please talk to your neighbors at lunch. Please continue the conversation. Please tweet. Please blog. Um, let's, let's get thoughts flowing. Um, I'm going to ask our panelists to close by saying their name again so that if you walk, to them, walk up to them at lunch, you don't have to like pretend like you know who they are and you can't remember their name. Um, so they'll say their name again. And then I ask them to share the KubeCon presentation that is not their own that they are most interested in attending, or not most interested, but interested in attending this week. So Chris, you want to lead us off again? Sure. Uh, so again, Chris Nova, uh, work at Heptio. Um, the presentation I'm most excited about this week is a really close friend of mine, uh, Locky. He works at Microsoft. Uh, he's doing a presentation on Istio. And that's like admittedly one of the things I don't know very much about. So I'm going to get to go and sit in this like with a pair of like noob eyes and learn about Istio for the first time. So I'm really pumped about that. I'm uh, Clayton Coleman, work at Red Hat, and I think I'm going to go to Brennan's keynote because he t piqued my interest. I'm Paul Mori. I work at Red Hat, and I'm most looking forward to SIG sessions so I can talk to folks in the community uh, about what they're interested in. I'm Brendan Burns uh, at Microsoft Azure. Um, I think I'm going to cheat and say that I'm actually most interested in talking to people in the hallway. Um, actually, the one-on-one -on -one conversations is always really my, my favorite part at the booth or in the hallway, so please don't hesitate to come up and chat. Um, and that's it. I'm Aparna Sinha, um, a product manager, work at Google. Um, it's very hard to pick one talk. I'm looking forward to all the keynotes. Um, I'm really looking forward to Chris Nova and Robert Bailey's talk on the cluster API, which allows you to consistently uh, deploy and manage uh, Kubernetes uh, on all environments. Awesome. Well, thank you all. These, these are awesome people that are panelists. They are totally approachable. So please you know, bug them all week long. Um, I'll, I'll buy them a beer if you bug them too much. Um, anyway, they, they are all here to meet all of you and to have these conversations. So thank you very much. Thanks.